بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Welcome once again to a new episode of Islam 101. We have with us here today some of our respected guests. To my left, we have Brother Saleh, Brother Suleiman, and we have Sardal, and my respected guest, Nick. Nick. Today, we're going to deal with another extremely important topic and concept in Al Islam that's centered around Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Prophet and Messenger of Allah the Prophet and Messenger of Al-Islam, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And that is the concept that he has been sent as a mercy to all of the worlds. And this concept comes to us from an ayah from the Quran itself, a verse from the Quran, in which Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala said, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to all of the worlds. He is a mercy to the alameen. And as any and every Muslim knows, in Surah Al-Fatiha, the Umm Al-Quran, the Umm Al-Kitab, the first chapter of the Quran that we read at least 17 times every day when we make an, our prayer, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a number of things and we praise Allah. From the things that we say in Surah Al-Fatiha is, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Allah is the Lord of all the worlds. All praises are due to Allah, the Lord of all of the worlds. So Al Alameen, it is everything other than Allah. That is the definition that has been given to the Alamun by the ulama of Al Islam. The Alamun is what? Kullu Shay Siwallah. Everything other than Allah. It is all of the creation other than Allah because Allah is the creator and He is not the created. So as it relates to this ayat and the issue of what we're dealing with today, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ This ayat, this verse goes to show that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a mercy to all of the worlds, everything in existence. He is a mercy to the Muslims. He's a mercy to the non-Muslims. He's a mercy to the men. He's a mercy to the children. He's a mercy to women. He's a mercy to plants and vegetation. He's a mercy to the jinn. He's a mercy to the malaika or the angels. He is a mercy to all of the worlds. As it relates to this issue of Rasulullah Muhammad being a mercy to all the worlds, Allah has mentioned in the Quran a number of characteristics concerning Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For an example, he mentioned in the Quran, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضٍ غَلِيذَ الْقَلْبِ لَمْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكَ It was a rahmah, a mercy unto you, ya Muhammad, that you were easy with these people. Meaning the people that were following him from the companions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to deal with them in an easy, kind, and a just way. Some of the people prior to Islam, for an example, they used to intake a lot of intoxicants. Some of them used to do things that were from the major sins, like carry on with extramarital relationships and other than that. When Rasulullah came, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to that environment, he did not make the consumption of intoxicants and alcohol haram or prohibited right away. Instead, he did it with a tadarruj. He did it step by step and in stage by stage. So this ayat, we have made you to them a rahmah. And had it not been for the fact that you were easy with them, they would have dispersed from amongst you. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sign to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that that's one of the many favors that Allah bestowed upon him. So that ayat goes to show that the Prophet of Al-Islam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to deal with his companions and he used to deal with his enemies and he used to deal with the people of Medina and Mecca in a way in which he showed them a lot of mercy. 
Concerning the rahmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the creation, the mercy that he used to have on the creation, there was no discrimination with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as it relates to this mercy. He didn't hold the mercy only for the Arabs. He didn't hold the mercy only for his relatives, but he was indiscriminate with showering his mercy upon everyone, close and far. For an example, we take the situation with the women and the children. He said in an authentic hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنِّي أُحَرِّجُ الضَّعِفَيْنِ الْمَرْأَ وَالْيَتِينِ Verily, I am concerned for and with the condition of the two weak people. The two weak people, the woman as well as the orphan. The woman, because in any given society, you will find the woman is oppressed. Like in our society, in the U.S., in the West, the woman has been reduced to a sex object. So if you want to sell a car, put a naked woman on the billboard. If you want to sell toothpaste, put a naked woman on the billboard. If you want to sell a mobile phone, put a naked woman on a billboard. So she has been oppressed in that she's been reduced to being a sex object. Also, in addition to that, in the times of Jahiliyyah, the pre-Islamic times, the women, they had no rights. They didn't have the right to inherit. If a woman gave birth to a female child, the father will take the child as soon as the child came out of the womb and he will go to the desert and bury the daughter child alive. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam came with a religion that made all of that impermissible. It gave the woman rights. It gave her rights over her body. It gave her rights over who she can marry. It gave her rights over inheritance. It gave her right and gave her the ability to get divorced. So he was a rahmah to the women. One time Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was making the prayer. And he used to like to make a prayer that was long when he used to be the salat. So he had the intention of making the salat. But when he went into the salat, he heard the crying of a baby, which is a proof that women and children can come to the masjid in Al-Islam. And it's from the culture of the people when they prevent women and children from coming to the masjid. When they rely upon weak and fabricated hadith. Keep your crazy people and the children away from the masjid. This is not an authentic hadith. During the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, women and children used to be in the masjid. And an example of that is this point that we're making right now. He would have the intent of making the salat and praying for a long time. But he would hear the crying of the baby. And then he would shorten the prayer. After he gave the taslim, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, he turned around to the people and he said, I wanted to prolong the prayer, but I heard the crying of a child. And I didn't want to make things difficult for the mother. So I shortened the prayer. And he told every imam who leads the people in the prayer. If any of you wants to make the prayer, the lead of the prayer, the imam, then shorten your prayer, make it easy, make it light, make it simple. For verily behind you in the congregation, there is the one who is sick, the one who has something to do, the one who is weak, and also you have the woman who may have her child. So that's one of the glaring examples from his sunnah in which he used to try to make things easy upon the women and the children. He would also go to the masjid and he would make the salat and his grandchildren like Al-Hasan wal Hussein, radiallahu anhuma. May Allah be pleased with his two grandchildren, the two sons of Ali and Fatima. They used to get on his back when he would make the sajda. And out of fear of getting up and causing them to fall over, he would remain in the sajda position or the prostration position for an extended period of time. After the salat, the companions would ask, Ya Rasulullah, why did you stay in the sajda position for so long? He would explain to them, because my grandsons, Hassan and Hussein got on my back and I didn't want to get up to make them fall over. Maybe one of them would have hurt themselves. 
So that's an example of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being kind to those people who he considered to be from the weakest of the community, the women as well as the orphan. That orphan is the individual who he loses his father at a young age. And anyone who is in a position where he lost his father, he knows the fitna or the trial of growing up as an orphan. He shouldn't have a complex or an uqda because he's an orphan. No, the best of the creation, the khairun nas and the sayyid of Bani Adam, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself, he was an orphan. Rasulullah grew up as an orphan. So if a person is an orphan, he has an imam, yuqtada bihi. He has an imam who preceded him, who's an example for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But as it relates to the orphan, the orphan's life is a difficult life because the child that does not have his father, he doesn't have the person who's there to defend for him, to fend for him, to protect him, to provide for him. His rights are easily usurped and taken away. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to look out for the rights of the orphan. And he said in an authentic hadith, Ana wa kafil al yatim kahataini fil jannah wa ja'ala usba'ihi hakada. He said, I will be in the paradise along with the one who takes care of the orphan. So I'm an individual who, if I hear a hadith like that, that hadith will encourage me to be responsible for an orphan, to become the kafil, the one who's responsible for the tarbiyah and the upbringing of an orphan, because I want to be like that with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannah. And why did he do like this as opposed to doing like this? Why did he split between his fingers as opposed to putting his fingers together? The scholars of Islam said the wisdom behind that is because in the Jannah, there is a place that is called the Maqam al Mahmud, the special place that has been designated for Rasulullah and Rasulullah only, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one was shared with him in that place. No Nabi, no angel, no prophet, no messenger, no angel, not even his wife or his child, no wali, no individual will be in that maqam al mahmud in that special place. They will be close to him, his family will be close to him, the kafil of the yatim, the one who takes care of the orphan will be close to him, but no one will be in that place with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because he is the khatim of the anbiya and the rasul. He is the seal of all of the prophets and he is the best of Adam's children. So those are some examples of how he was a rahmah to certain segments of the society. In particular, the woman as well as the orphan. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also a rahmah, a mercy to the animals in the way that he dealt with the animals and in the legislation that he gave concerning the animals. And we'll deal with that inshallah when we return from this break. Hada wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyin al kareem Islam 101 Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wa'l-tuqa wal-afafa wal-ghina Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda wa'l-tuqa wal-afafa wal-ghina Islam 101. Welcome back to Islam 101 where we've been discussing the concept and the theory that Muhammad is a mercy to all of the worlds. And as we mentioned in the last segment, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was also a mercy to the animals. He was a mercy to the animals in the way that he treated the animals himself. And in the way that he has legislated that Muslims should also deal with and treat the animals. He said in an authentic hadith, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, دَخَلَتْ النَّارِ إِمْرَأَةٌ فِي حِرَّةٌ مَا أَتْعَمَتْهَا وَمَا تَرَكَتْهَا تَأْكُ مِنْ حَشَاشِ الْأَرْضِ There was a lady, a woman, who entered into the hellfire because of a cat. She held the cat. She held the cat in her home. And she didn't feed the cat, nor did she allow the cat to go out in the earth to eat from the insects of the earth. So as a result of that, that lady went into the hellfire 
because of her cruelty to the animal. So that's a clear proof and a clear indication that Al-Islam is a religion that takes care of the rights of the animals. And how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa himself made a point that if you're going to hold and be responsible for taking the freedom of an animal, then you're responsible for, eat, for treating the animal right by making sure you give the animal a place to live that's comfortable and you also feed the animal correctly. Similar to it is that he made it impermissible for the Muslims to brand the animal on his face. There's a man, he owns camels, sheep, cows. So when he sends his animals out to the pasture to graze, he wants his animals to be distinct from the animals of other farmers, other herders. So what he does is he brands the animal. He wants to put on the animal a mark that would signify that it's his animal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made it impermissible for someone to brand the animal on the face because that is the ta'vi to the animal. We mentioned as well in one of the episodes that have gone by that he told us sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَتَبَ عَلَيْكُمْ الْإِحْسَانِ فِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ فَإِذَا قَتَلْتُمْ فَحْسِنَ الْقِتْلَ وَإِذَا ذَبَحْتُمْ فَحْسِنَ الْذِبْحَ وَلِيُحِدَّ أَحَدُهُمْ شِفْرَتُهُ وَلِيُرِحْ ذَبِحَتَ Verily Allah has written perfection on everything. He has ordered you to be the best that you can be in whatever you do. So if you kill, kill well. If you slaughter, slaughter well. One of you should take your knife and be sure to sharpen the knife very good so as to keep the animal from suffering. We find in the Western world, they hit the head, they hit the animal over the head with a sledgehammer. They take electrodes and they give the animal electric shock. The chickens, they put the chicken in boiling water and they kill them by drowning them and scorching them to death. If someone were to take a chicken and to burn him like that and burn him water, scorching water in the Islam, that meat is impermissible to eat and the individual is also sinning. So all of those are some of the many examples of how he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to be kind to the animals. From the miracles of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is an incident that took place when he was sitting down and a camel walked up to him and a camel started to make a noise. All of the people sitting around looked at the camel and they wondered what was going on. The camel was talking to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Some people, when they hear something like that because of their lack of faith, they'll think that this is a bedtime story for children. But we say, Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who brought us out of the wombs of our mothers, the one who all of these miracles that are going on around us on a daily basis, signs, we say, that he is capable of doing any and everything. We don't have a problem with believing in issues like that. The camel said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his own language, a language that Allah allowed Rasulullah to understand, that my owner is oppressing me. He puts a lot of burden upon me and he doesn't give me enough food to eat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called the companions and he said, who is the owner of this camel? A man said, I'm the owner of the camel, Ya Rasulullah. Rasulullah said to him, Very this camel has complained to me that you overburden him in the work and you also don't give him enough food to eat. So if any of you possesses animals, then take care of your animals. Inna vulm, vulumat, yomul qiyamah. Verily oppression will be signs of darkness, causes of darkness, yomul qiyamah, even as it relates to the animals. So we're going to stop there as it relates to this particular segment so that we could take some of the questions of our respected panel here because I'm sure they have a lot of issues that they want to have dealt with. So, Nick, let's start with you, Nick. Any questions? Yeah, well, to be back to the question of female rights, I want to ask you a question. What are the female rights in Islam now and how is compared to female rights uh, feminists are struggling for? That's an excellent question, Nick, and actually it should be a topic unto itself. Muslims, as I mentioned in this segment, Muhammad is a rahmah to all of the worlds. In particular, he was a rahmah sent to defend and to take care of the rights of women. So we've been mentioning over and over again, and we want to continue on this path that we have to remain in the middle course, the sirat al-mustaqim. 
Al-Islam looks out for the rights of women, gave her the right to divorce, gave her to write the right to have a free choice in her will to get married to this one or not to get married to that one, gave her the ability to inherit, gave her the right to have something to say as it relates to the way the family structure is going to function. She has too many rights. There is a verse or a surah in the Quran, a chapter called Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah of the Quran, the fourth chapter, all about the rights of the women. So well, Islam came to protect their rights, but we have to remain in the middle. We want to stay away from the extremes of the feminists, those women who want to be equal to the men. We say without apologizing, as Allah said in the Quran, وَلَيْسَ الذَّكُرُكَ unsa." The woman is not like the man, and the man is not like the woman. Both of them are perfect in the way that Allah has created them, and they both have their separate, unique jobs and roles and responsibilities. So the feminists, they seem to want to be exactly like men. They want to dress like men. They want to act like men. They want to be men in female bodies and in female minds. And this is something that is rejected by the religion of Islam. We take care of their rights, but we make the distinction as the distinction was made in the religions that came before us. The religion that Jesus brought, the religion that Moses brought, the religion that Abraham brought, all of them made it clear that the men had a role to play and the women had another role to play. And the role of the women is not a role of being subservient. That's not their role. They are worshipers of Allah. They are the amma of Allah. The handmaidens of Allah. The man is Abdullah and the woman is Amatullah. He's the slave of Allah and she is also the servant of Allah. Both of them have been created to worship Allah and he put rules and regulations that are general to both of them and certain rules and regulations that are specific to both of them and each sex. They have to be happy and satisfied with how Allah has created him, them as Allah said in the Quran. وَلَا يَتَمَنُّوا وَلَا تَتَمَنُّوا مَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بِهِ بَعْضُكُمْ عَلَى بَعْضُ The men should not wish and desire to be like women in what Allah gave them virtues in, nor should the women desire to be like men in those things that Allah has given the men virtues and darajat levels over the women. So that's an excellent question. If we were to remain in the middle and we found the happy medium, then both sexes will live in harmony with each other. But when the man wants to become a woman, he wants to become a homosexual, or the woman wants to become a man, she wants to be a lesbian, she wants to be equal to the man, that's when there's going to be corruption in the earth and there's going to be problems because people lose the role. The child is not the parent and the parent is not the child. The leader is not the one who's the subject and the subject is not the leader. Everyone has to hold on to his role. Any one of you want to ask a question? Oh. Saleh. Uh, my, question that, uh, my question is that uh, if it is true that uh, Islam came to provide women the uh, all rights taken away from uh, from air, why is a uh, man allowed in Islam to be a leader? Uh, I mean an imam and a uh, woman is not allowed. That's an excellent question as well, Saleh. Because right now we're dealing with this issue, especially in America, where for the first time in the history of Al-Islam, and Allah knows best, a woman led the Muslim men and women in the Friday congregation prayer. This is the first time this has ever happened in Al-Islam. And that is a classic example of people going overboard. وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُعْتَدِينَ Don't go overboard. Don't go outside of the limits that have been ordained by Allah. Allah doesn't love those people who go outside of the limits that have been ordained by Him. As it relates to the Salat and the question of Brother Saleh, why is it that the woman can't lead the men in the Salat? Why is that? Well, there are a number of reasons behind that, a number of wisdoms behind that. First of all, the woman does not pray all month long. There is a time of the month where the woman can't pray as a result of what happens to her naturally. As long as she has not reached the age of menopause or there's no medical issues going on with inside of her, she's going to have a monthly cycle. And it is a well-known fact, during this time, her hormones are all over the place. She is feeling a certain way. As a result of that, Al-Islam said the woman does not have to pray during this particular time. 
This mince, akramakumullah, is an adha. It is a hurt for the woman at that time, so she doesn't have to pray. So that is one reason that disqualifies her from leading the men in the salat. Another issue is that the positions of the salat and the way that we pray and the way that we make our movements in the prayer. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna aqrab ma yakun al-abd ila Allah wa huwa sajid fa akthiru fiha bid-du'a. The closest that the servant is to Allah is when he's in sajda, when he's prostrating. So increase your dua while you're prostrating. The, the son of Adam, the human being, he has ego, he can be arrogant, he has izza, honor. When he becomes humble, he puts his head on the ground and he says, I recognize Allah as being the one who created me. And therefore, I'm going to submit myself physically in this position. That's one of the clearest manifestations of the humility of the servant, showing that he worships Allah and recognizes him as the almighty God and creator. Well, in that position, even though it's a virtuous position in the prayer and in what it's saying, nonetheless, it's not a position that is befitting for a woman to be in front of men. A woman should not be in front of men in such a position. Al-Islam has ordered us that we have separation of the two sexes in al-Islam. And we don't apologize about that separation. So that's one of the reasons also why women cannot lead the prayer. This is quite an important topic, so we'll add on to it in the upcoming episodes. And we're going to take leave from you, and we ask Allah to put his mercy and his rahmah upon all of us, and may he make it easy for us and easy for you. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you in an upcoming episode, inshallah. <laughs> Islam.